Well, again, I want to thank you guys all again. It's, it's, uh, it's a pleasure for us to be here today, and we, we sincerely appreciate this uh, time to come in front of you and talk about the, some of the testing we've done. Uh, so Gavin asked me to talk to you guys and give you an update about the kind of the VDI testing that we've done. So we decided to focus on what we really do well. One of those applications is VDI. So we decided to do a lot of testing around it, but really, so about storage, storage's role in VDI, you know, most of the problems are with data storage. They really are. Yeah, you can have CPU, you can have RAM, you can have network, but the majority of the problems that we see are from data storage. And it's not just necessarily from a technical problem, it's also from a business problem. Uh, you know, it, huge amounts of CapEx. We typically see storage can take anywhere up to 40 to 50% of the initial purchase price just to get a VDI solution in the door. I mean, that is an enormous cost. And then once you do, usually huge amounts of power and cooling, the warranty costs can absolutely kill you when you start talking about years four and year five. And especially for a cloud provider that say has to monetize this whole thing, that completely messes up your entire business model if you have to do that. Then they have performance problems. You know, booting, there's a lot of nasty things that go on inside of a VDI environment. Uh, it's not just about the regular workload. One of the, the only application I've worked on that was harder than VDI for storage was Exchange 2000. And that was back when it's one to one per, you know, one IOP per user. And we would had like a 240 disk EVA with 10 DL585s to try to do something to 25,000 users. And we ended up running out on the processors too. But this is a really nasty, nasty uh, application. <clears throat> And really, it comes from the user experience, because your main thing here is about the user experience. And performance from storage directly translates into the user experience faster than almost anything else does. So some of the real world examples we deal with, this is some of our customers, a uh, customer named Seven Corners. They're basically a 24 by seven VDI shop. They have disconnects during the day. They can't do deploys, or they have a very small window where they can do deploys. They have to fit them in all now. Uh, Avmed, all the planning that they did for their VDI, completely out the window. What they did absolutely shattered everything that they had planned for. They were a lot more aggressive than they thought they'd be. And uh, Garland Independent School District, really over 30,000 different computing devices, 22 campus locations, a massive environment. And they actually offer AutoCAD to their users. So it all comes down to the user experience. And VDI is a little different than other applications. Like you, either your users are happy or they're really not happy. If your email goes down, yeah, email goes down. It's an important resource for the company. It's how the company can communicate. But you can still get on Skype. You can still get on Google Mail. You can still work on Word documents and PowerPoint and all this other stuff. VDI goes down or slows down. A relatively small organization can measure their downtime in thousands of dollars an hour because literally everybody in the organization stops. So it has a huge impact. <clears throat> So what we've done is we've decided not to be testing with the traditional storage performance testing tools. You know, Iometer, IOZone, SQL IO, those kinds of things, because while they're good for synthetic load testing, we can do much better now. So we use a, a program called Login VSI that actually simulates desktops doing real work. It works with VMware, Zen, Hyper-V. So that's why we've sta standardized on that one, because all of our testing going forward that we're going to do, because we're going to hit all of these things before the end of the year, or we're going to try to, <laughs> that's my goal. Uh, is going to be used with login VSI. It's a fairly easy program. They're over in the in the uh, the vendor vendor booth area, and they're they're great to talk to. So what did we do? Well, essentially, we had our regular normal operations. So for 1,500 desktops, we're sitting at around 8,000 IOs, just under the login VSI medium workload. <clears throat> Ends up being about five IOPS per user, fairly low, uh, but it was just designed for just a, not a knowledge worker sending 10 meg PowerPoints like I do. <laughs> It was just basically somebody just editing Word documents, sending email, regular things like that. Uh, then we also measured a login storm. So it will actually log in all 1,500 users before it starts its workload. And to that, we got it up to somewhere between 10 to 15,000 IOs. Again, not crazy. I mean, we're still in the realm of possibility here with, uh, with normal traditional things. But then your deploys and recomposes start or where it starts getting really nasty. So for the 1,500 user level, we're talking 15,000 to 25,000 IOs is what we saw. And then we have the bootstorm. That's the fun one. Well, normally where things go off the rails is pretty much on the bootstorm. Because for 1,500 desktops, we're hitting somewhere in the range of 50,000 IOs. Uh, I can get the, on a, I did some testing on a DL585 about a year ago, year and a half ago, and I could punch it up past 60,000 IOs pretty easily. So these things can, can really, this is where the big hit's gonna come from. But the problem is here, you have to be able to deal with all of these things. You can't size an environment for 40, 50,000 IOs. I mean, that's where the CapEx thing and the, and the power and cooling come from and why it's so expensive. But you really have to be able to deal with this, but all of these other things have to be accommodated. So this, not too bad, but very latency sensitive. So how do you do that? That's, that's what we really wanted to test. We wanted to see how all of these things interact together.
So this is one of the bootstorm tests we did. So this is coming off of one of a single ISE box. So this is 500 users, that's 1,000 users. So not a whole lot of difference in how high they got, but the difference is in how long it took because of the, the limitations we had in CPU and RAM inside of the Cisco UCS. You know, 40, 50,000 IOs, but there's normal operations. I mean, this thing can be six times higher than what your normal operations are, but the problem is everybody configures for this and they think, well, we'll just throw some extra flash in there and that'll probably handle this thing and we won't hear anything. So it's about giving performance for where it's needed. So initially we started out with our all hard drive series. So we call that the 200 series. It's about delivering IOPS with hard drives. Now we can make our drives run, you know, four to five times faster than everyone else because of the Seagate heritage and what we can do with the drives. So that gives us very consistent performance, which is something you really need in a VDI solution. You know, typically storage arrays, you have to get 60, 70 percent, they'll fall off a cliff for performance. And for VDI, it's exactly the wrong thing you want, because as you're increasing the number of users, your potential starts going down. And when those lines cross, that's when you start having problems. Yes, sir. Sorry, I missed what you said there about the Seagate heritage. Oh, we were actually born in the Seagate in 2000. No, I know that, but the speed increase. Oh, we can, we can, we have different firmware on the drives. Typically, uh, you know, maybe a 10K RPM drive will get somewhere between 125 to about 175 IOs reliably. You can push them higher, harder than that, but normal operation, you're somewhere in that range. We can get somewhere between four and 600. Out of the same 10K RPM drive with just our firmware on. Is it tweaking the local cache mm -hmm. on the disks? Too? It's doing a lot to the disks. We also changed the way that we lay out data on the disk because now we can see into the drives. So our controllers, when they're talking to the drives, it's not just, hey, put this on LBN 4368.24. It's put this on platter this, you know, head this at the, this position. So we're actually striping at the platter head level inside the drive because we can see inside of it. Explain the grid as well. Yeah, you see, and, and so we, what we do is we basically, you have 40 drives inside the array. We break it up into a big grid. It looks like a barbershop pole if you split the half of it and lay it out uh, because we'll stripe data across the platters and heads across all the drives. But then we're going to reserve space across every drive for spare heads that we have because our unit of failure is not the drive, it's the head inside the drive. And that firmware really only works in, in your our box. system with, yeah. Correct, with Seagate drives. And I was just it, about to say, yeah. Yep, only Seagate. <laughs> <laughs> and is it tuned towards a VDI workload as well? It's, when they initially designed the product, they went after random workloads. So the guys who built the EVA built this thing. Uh, so they were trying to go after workloads that were, that were really challenging for the EVA, like database applications. Exchange was one of the big ones that we went after. So they were really targeting random workloads and trying to get the, the, the performance up there while you still can have high capacity utilization levels. So just real quick, the Compaq EVA, yeah? Yep. So you've got the guys that built the EVA, yep. and you've got guys that came out of Seagate as well, and right. you still have hooks into Seagate. I believe we do. I think we still have some guys writing firmware for us. Um, yeah. I hope the mics can pick me up. Our CTO is Richie Larry, who okay. was the CTO of Deck Storage Works. Oh, right. Then become right. Compact Storage Works, then become yeah. HP Storage Works. Also, Steve Sicola. Uh, was one of our the inventors of this box, basically the mm -hmm. technology. So a lot of those guys who put together the original EVA are actually still on our team as well. Obviously, they've been supplemented over the years. Yeah. Uh, I'm just thinking with that custom firmware, you're not stranded on that particular version. Then, if there's like a bug fix, or no, we do get new versions of firmware and we do up the, update the code so that, that we do get new versions. Firmware. So we we work to design to each oh, okay. each time a new yeah. drive comes out. Yeah. Obviously, we get good access to Seagate. Yeah. We're still actually heavily involved with Seagate. They're still, uh -huh. they're still funders of ours uh, to a degree. Um, and we get a lot of insight into the drives they're bringing out. Each time there's a new drive, you'll often see Seagate release a drive and then a few months later, we'll support that drive in our systems because we're just working out how we look at it between the firmware at a platter and a, and a head level rather than a driver. That said, when we get onto the flash and the solid state stuff, you'll notice that we don't use Seagate solid state drives. So we're not actually, we take advantage of a lot of Seagate because we chose at that time to do. If tomorrow we wanted to switch to metal manufacture, it's not actually that tricky for us because we, what we have to do is deconstruct the drive, so to speak. Uh, just right now we use Seagate exclusively for hard drives uh, and we use Smart Technologies, which is now SanDisk for solid state. Uh, we're looking at some future products at the moment that could use any manufacturer. Um, so we've got a lot of flexibility in the product. Right now, sorry, I'm cutting across no, here. We, we believe to get the balance of cost, growth, and risk, we're going to use Seagate hard drives and smart SSD, EMLC SSDs. I always joke that we've got a, a platform that's built around choice rather than we chose the media first and then built the platform around it, which a lot of people have done, especially in the all flash array market. If in six months' time the leading technologies to get that balance are memoristers and holographic storage, 
it doesn't matter because we design an architecture that can take those and you'll see when we get to the chassis. It could be hamsters on spinning wheels and leprechauns. We kind of don't care as long as we can, we take advantage of that media and then write to it in different ways. So when we get to the hybrid box, you'll see how that works. Just going to say the question, when you're talking about data placement down to the head level, so your unit of granularity to say, what can I afford to lose in this architecture? It's the head, which implies the platter that it's... Correct, or that side of the platter. If there's physical damage on the platter, we can also spare around that as well. Okay, so when you're talking rate availability, you calculate that out down to that sublayer as opposed to the disc being the unit. So, correct, yeah. So there's a lot of different ways of doing RAID inside of a virtualized array. We chose the, you know, sometimes you basically make the RAID set across the disks, and then you lay your, your map on top of it, and that's where you get access to your LUNs. So we went at it kind of backwards from that. We basically gridded out all of the drives, so we know where all the platters are, everything. Um, and we lay that grid out first, and then we'll start putting RAID on top of that. So we'll start, so we have the map laid out, and then we just know where we're dropping these little pieces of data, and it makes it easier for us to, to do that kind of addressing when we have everything mapped out and then the RAID's on top of it. Because then the RAID's just an object we're moving around. And it means for reconstruction purposes as well, you're not reading the whole thing, you know, targeted exactly what pages need to be addressed. Exactly, especially in a VDI environment, when you start talking about a rebuild on a drive, that can just bring an array to its knees. I mean, even if you're separating your, your disk groups or RAID groups or whatever you're calling them, and it's only this one RAID group and the rest of it's okay, but it's still usually those same front-end array controllers that are managing the rebuild and the other activity, and it, it just crushes most arrays, definitely. Have you guys got anything that you can share with us, like document-wise and stuff at this kind of level? Because this is, I, I would assume for a lot of people here, this makes us understand a little bit. All oh, right, okay, yeah. yeah. I, I kind of see how you're doing this. Yeah, absolutely, we've got the grid system written up, so we can give you a couple okay. of yeah, okay. give you a couple. Just real quick, I, I, I might not know, does anybody else go down to that kind of a level and specialize with firmware on drives and it sounds, I don't know anybody else. I'm not aware of anybody who does. There was somebody a couple years ago who went out of business a while ago and they were saying they could spin down drives or doing something else. Okay. Copan, that's it, yep. That's, that's a whole different ballgame. <laughs> yeah, uh, no, there's no one else doing this. And the reason being is because of the Seagate pedigree. The, the irony is, and I'll tell you a story actually that you don't mind because a lot of people have heard this. The original intention was not to spin this out as a separate company. Seagate wanted to keep this because they want to sell this technology to OEM uh, channel providers. Um, are you picking me up? Okay. okay. Um, but what they took to the OEMs, and you can probably guess the names that would be interested in buying this because it's people that bought their drives, was an array that gives really good performance, really consistent, doesn't foul, and has a five year warranty free of charge included. A certain unnamed large storage vendor said, get out of the building, I want the division shut down, I want that guy fired who invented it, get out, this is a borrowing. Like, oh, the naivety, but what, what? So you don't realize, we make 25% of our annual revenues from service in the UNT, particularly years four and five. You're threatening to take that away. Yeah. Secondly, we use that years four and five as a stick which we call the lazy yeah. swap yeah. to make them upgrade to the latest correct technology. Yeah. We've convinced the market that storage only lasts three years. Forget Moore's law. And, and yeah, it makes sense for servers, but we've convinced them they should do it for storage as well. So what you're suggesting here kills our business model. We want it dead. Kill it. So the same guys that were funding Seagate actually funded taking it back out because Seagate had already acquired Ziotech, as it was known funded it back out and, and Ziotech bought this technology effectively and took it to market. What they then did was wrap it with controllers that were so-so to make it a SAN or an AS box. When the company really started to take off is when we separated around those controllers and focused on this box. But the whole idea was to make it an OEM to take away the shake and bake testing that is done by a lot of storage vendors because they have an array that just, it's, engineers kill me for saying this in XI, but I call it an intelligent JBOD. Apparently it's not. But. Uh, but it, it is essentially that point is that you just plug it in fiber channel or iSCSI and it just gives you good consistent performance like that. and as I said the things just don't go wrong and I'm not just making that up I was surprised how long has it been on the market? six years Okay. It's kind of the seven now. So what happens to maintenance costs and things after five years? Because you're yep. saying it's warranted for five years and then you're saying the other guys start. We, We've got customers that have had them seven years. They've taken an incremental warranty. Most people now, actually, it's quite interesting, have started buying our product with a six-year warranty. It's a very small uplift. It's not the old trick of using them. Yeah. We don't have that business model. We make our money up front. We don't expect any service annuity in the future. 
Um, what we started noticing is people buying it over six years because when they build the business case, their CFOs love them because they're skipping a refresh cycle. And you show you skip a refresh cycle, it makes the business case. As long as the performance is good enough, and that's the other thing we're seeing, is because we can stretch the performance on these things so much. We had a recent great example in Belgium where the customer said, I want an upgrade price because to upgrade my disk's capacity because I've just benchmarked you against NetApp. I was like, that's not fair. Our box is six years old. So, well, well, chill out, you won. So, <laughs> don't worry about it. <laughs> we'll, we'll take it. So it's just an upgrade. So how does it, how can you upgrade it then? I don't understand this how it works. We'll, we'll, can we, yep, we'll get onto the next slide and we'll explain yeah, yeah, yeah. that. Yeah, so I, I just wanted to throw in the, the all hard drive uh, version of the ISC. We actually completed a reference architecture with Citrix about a year ago, and we used all hard drive ISCs, and it performed great. It was awesome. We're up against flash arrays, and everybody's saying hard disks are slow. You'll never be as fast as flash. Well, you know what? Most of our latencies were under one millisecond. Exactly. And we only had to use hard drives because of the capacity they wanted us to do. That's a whole other story I'm not going to get into. Hey, so most of them were under one millisecond? What did they? The vast majority, like our 95th percent score was under one. I think 99th percent score was like one something. Oh. There's like one reading that pops up to one and everything else was below one. Um, and below one, we just, we didn't have that many significant digits at the time for the code. So it just says zero. But if it's zero, it's under one. So most of them are under one. Yep. But then we bring in and we combine SSDs with this reliable base that we can, we can use. And we have an intelligent uh, algorithm of moving hot blocks of data up to SSD. So we are doing tiering, but we're doing tiering in real time. So we don't have the problem that caching does in most solutions where you have to take up controller NVRAM just to address the cache. And the NVRAM is a thousand times faster than SSD. So why are you burning that stuff, the valuable stuff, just to hold the, just the address data? But then tiering solutions have the problem where, you know, they're only moving data every 12 or 24 hours. And that was fine when you're moving stuff down to SATA. But for SSD, you need it now. So we combine SSD and hard drive with a real-time tiering algorithm to really give very high performance for the blocks of data that need it. And then really reliable, consistent, very high capacity utilization for all the rest of the data. So this is the ISE itself, and these are, the, these are the data packs. You're asking how you upgrade different boxes. Uh, well, typically it just means swapping out the data packs. Now, you know, obviously if you're pulling a data pack out of here, you've got to get the data off of it. We do have a way where we can mirror data between two ISEs, and if the operating system is supported, uh, we can do it non-disruptively. Uh, then we also go after environments like VMware and VDI, where you know what? It's really easy to move data around because of the hypervisor. So that can make it almost a completely null point. So think of this like you do a blade server. Blade server is a fixed amount of compute and RAM. This is a fixed amount of performance and capacity. And if you need more, you drop more boxes in. So we basically have- The data packs have to be the same config in there. Uh, they don't have to be. Well, so the archive, one, archive ISE is for our you know, high, high um, capacity customers. Uh, this guy down here, about 38 terabytes raw capacity. We still use enterprise SAS drives for that. We don't use any nearline SAS or SATA anywhere in any of our solutions because it's just, you're putting these in, we, we intend you to put these in a place where you're just going to pound on them all day long, and that is not SATA and nearline SAS. Uh, then we have, come on. There we go. Then we have the, uh, the, the all hard drive solutions. These are our main hard drive models. We start off with 300 gig drives. Then we go 600, 900, and 1.2 terabytes. So that's really the only difference between them. They all have pretty much the same performance that we can get out of them. Uh, but this is really about how hot is your data. So this, uh, the 710 is about 22% SSD-ish, and the 740 goes down to about 7% SSD. If I buy an ISE 200 system, a 210, let's say, and then I, I decide I need some flash in there, can you then swap the data pack out? You can pull the data pack out and make it a 710, but to make it, it's, it's uh, yes, the upgrade is available from a commercial point of view. Yeah. It is a relay out of the data in that case because you're the changing the models. Your forty drives in that data. Yeah. Yep. You still have to pull all the data off of it. Either we can do that with a with the 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 utility to mirror data, or if you're using VMware or Citrix or any of the hypervisors, it's basically just evacuate the or take the data store offline. Yep. That's where you really happen because they're actually a small unit of capacity. Yeah. And once people start playing on us to realize the value of it, we've had lots of customers who've bought 200s, who've then bought 700s and sat them together and managed them together. Um, that's more common than people swapping out the data packs yeah. because actually a lot of the cost is in the drive packs. So by the time you buy new drive packs, you might as well buy the new chassis, buy the new chassis because the chassis doesn't, isn't actually a huge amount of the cost. But they're exactly the same chassis, same controllers, same super caps. 
Right, same power supplies, everything's the same. So the inside the disc packs, they're all two and a half inch devices? Okay. Okay. What's the rack space on them? How big are they? How, how big are the actual array space? The arrays or the SSDs? No, the arrays. What's the two U, three U, three school space. Oh, three U. Three U. Yep, three U. Three U, 19 inch rack, 700 watts, max power about 3.6 amps. Which is not bad. So like in 15U, in like a rack this big with, uh, with the 240s, you can get about 148 terabytes of usable RAID 5 capacity, about 45,000 IOs, and it'll do it for, for 18 amps. So less than, 20, less than 20 amps. So the IO figures that are stated there are based on RAID 5 -ing? Uh The IO, these here are based on RAID 1. These are all based on RAID 1. RAID 5... Are spec 1 type workloads. This is right. not the old trick. trick. <laughs> <laughs> trick. Of Fiat 500 going off a cliff. Exactly. Technique. Can I, does anybody around here buy or have any customers that buy storage over six years? I will write it down over, I mean, because it's a dinosaur within a year at the moment. It, it can be, but if you're starting talking about skipping a refresh, refresh cycle, you know, upper level C, CFOs and things like that are thinking, hey, I can get past my server refresh cycle without buying storage again. And that's, that's really attractive for some people. It, it, it's a message that resonates. Plotted out, we've had a lot of customers plot out their IO workloads. And yeah, there are some people that are working at a phenomenal pace and are going to swap it out. But they also have a lot of workloads where they can write it off over long periods. The, the, the general argument we're hearing back from customers is that servers, absolutely, three years is a lifetime. You know, like dinosaurs by the time they get to three years. But that's not the case with storage. I mean, every storage vendor has got that storage performance gap slide where they show that. Out. Now, there are. There are use cases, yeah. you know, we always talk about there's a use case where you need an SLC or flash array. Absolutely, they are going to exist. We don't play in that space, but they exist. But it's a smaller thing than the general purpose. We looked at a lot of VDI workloads, we looked at a lot of customers and, and, and said, you know, how's your IO rates and your latency requirements changed over the years? And you know what, in the last five to six years, a lot of them haven't changed. Now, don't get me wrong, there are customers that are moving at a faster pace than that. Absolutely. But the, the cross-section of the market that we spent a lot of time analyzing, yeah, they need it on processing power, but he'll show you in a minute, we're burning out processing units that you wouldn't believe before we hit saturation point on our storage. So these are, we're the only storage vendor, and it drives me nuts sometimes, uh, now I've just taken over marketing, I'll probably change it, that use worst case figures. Everyone else uses the best case, we can do a million IOs per second. With a tiny little block size. I have to line correctly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we don't. We give worst case. I mean, it's just may, maybe sometimes we're too honest. That's actually what I try to stress when I do my benchmarks for customers. Is I give me under the worst case conditions. This is what the system under stress will behave like. And under those conditions, anything else after that is gravy. You have a sequential workload that slides in. Great, right. it'll work fine. How many customers have? We actually see storage vendors that give guidelines to proof of concepts. That always makes me laugh. I don't know what's scary, vendors doing that or customers accepting that. Uh, where they say, don't fill it up more than 5% and do the test over 12 hours. That's why we don't do a garbage <laughs> on a day <laughs> Sunday. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it's like, no, 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 no. Fill this thing up at 90%. We like customers that beat it. Our biggest problem is customers that say, yeah, I tested it with one server with a dual core processor. Like, Jesus. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's a common problem. Yep, and all of our boxes come with a five-year hardware warranty for free. Everything. That's been one of the cornerstones of our product since we launched it back in 2008. With the option for that sixth year. With the option for six and seven. And seven. Yep. So it's so in doing this, we learned a lot of things about uh, just about the environment. So you you don't really learn anything as a storage vendor if you're just going to spin up Iometer and start pounding on something. I mean, hey, I heard they came out with a new version of Iometer a little while ago. I can learn that, but I mean, that's really about it. For us, it was more about figuring out where the V admins coming from. You know, what are they having to deal with? What are some of the things that they've got to do? And we put a lot of effort into our integration with VMware. So we integrate in with the V with the vSphere APIs uh, for management. We also are VAAI compliant. We have a Vasa 1.0 provider. We're working on 2.0. Vvols is on the roadmap. You know, yep, that, that whole thing, absolutely. So the, oh yeah, so yeah, we know that one. <laughs> so the idea being that from our from our single interface, and I know you guys can't see it up here, but you can basically see the individual data stores inside of clusters. From one interface, you can go ahead and set everything up. We have plugins for the vSphere Windows and web clients uh, at the booth right now. I'm running our this is our pre-release plugin for the vCVA. So we actually have it running on the VCVA itself. 
Uh, again, manage multiple ISE systems. This is a screenshot of the, uh, the Windows client for VMware. We have our little XIO storage tab over here. You can see all different kinds of system components. Everything you need to actually manage the entire environment can be done from inside the vSphere interface. It's really about giving the admins the tool that they, tools that they're familiar with and they already know to make this as easy as possible. And we can do a lot of automation with this. You know, it'll, if you're saying I want to give a data store to a cluster, now I don't have to realize, I don't have to go to the, the array and create the LUN and do LUN masking for all the nodes in the cluster and then give the LUN ad address and then go tell the servers to rescan and then tell them to pick up the LUN, create the data store and do the multipath policy. Correct. All of that stuff is done through our interface. It makes things a lot easier. I used to do this by hand about six, seven months ago because I was thinking I want to control everything and I just want to make sure it's done how I, no, this is a lot easier. <laughs> I mean, this is this takes minutes. This is fantastic. Is there an API for all that sort of stuff as well? Uh, we actually, our box talks REST, so it's everything is representational state transfer. So you can actually write XML and get everything back from our box that we're doing for our management platform. There's, there's you tell the hypervisor which uh, multipathing to use. So we use the in, the embedded uh, multipathing software of all the hypervisors. So for like VMware, we'll support fixed round robin and what's that third one? We always select round robin. That's the one that we like them to use. Yep, well, we can also do the same thing for Citrix and Hyper-V as well, because we just use the native multipathing thing. We don't have any host, we don't have any host software. That answers the question. Yep, yep, we don't like, I come from the secure path days in Compaq, and I'm telling you, I don't like host software. All your own multipath might be worth mentioning active active as well. Oh yeah, so, oh wow, that's kind of cool. There we go. So active active, so let's talk multipathing while we're on it. So we have a capability, I don't know if anybody's familiar with the VMS parallel disk clusters. Long time ago, right? Okay, so the guys who basically built all that stuff for DEC are the guys who built our box. So the host thinks it's talking to the same disk. It just has eight paths to what it thinks is the same disk. So it can read and write from either side of the mirror, and it's the ISEs that manage the locking behind the scenes of, of when there's writes. So that if there's a problem, literally it's a path failure from as far as the server's, constant, server's um, concerned. And now you can do, you can do, um, DR, you can do failover between metro distance sites like with a stretch cluster with regular VMware HA. You don't need SRM. So it makes things a whole lot easier for V admins. And we're seeing a lot of interest in that. I think our greatest market for that is going to be Florida because for some odd reason, the smallest towns in Florida have fiber everywhere. Like, I don't know why. Like, the cable companies came in and wired everything in the town. There's one, uh, I think it was the city of Ocala that I was talking to. Like, you drive through horse fields to get to this place. A couple buildings in town, they got 30 strands of fiber between every building. What's your, what's your worst case internode latency? Inter I'm sorry? What's your worst case internode latency that you can afford there uh, for an active active metro? Right, so, we, so I, we, we don't necessarily do it in terms of latency, we do it in terms of distance because it has to be dark fiber, like you have to light your own fiber. Like, so we don't... I mean, I know. the tour the only, I know, only the thing tour that the does is give you low, lower latency. Exactly, I know, it's what's... It still goes to... It's seven microseconds per, per kilometer. I think it's either seven microseconds or five microseconds per kilometer, multiply 20 or 40 kilometers, and that's pretty much it. Yeah. We like to see it under, you know, around 200. Under 15. Oh, way under that. This is no, synchronous, no, so... If your application's going to spoil, at the end of the day, this is always yeah, a problem of having synchronous limits. No, if people kilometer. are prepared... Oh, yeah, for 40. If people are prepared for the, for the high limits, uh, then it's good. We, we get very uncomfortable once people start going over, you know, the hundred uh, point of things because we know it's going to cause problems and we don't want people thinking the storage array is slow. Kind of defeats the point of having a consistent performance storage array. So it's on a case by case basis uh, and we're looking at the overall latency, not necessarily the distance because you're right, there's some people that pop pops in and it's yeah. not really dark. That's a favourite of ours. It's dark but it's got four hops. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, we just we commonly talk in terms of latency because it's the easiest thing for us to relate. But yes, it is it is an actual latency value, and it's fairly low. <laughs> okay, we also have plugins for VC Operations Manager. We just finished our 1.0 version of that a little while ago. This helped a ton on our testing because we had about four or five ISEs we were pulling data from, and this thing just sucks data all the time from the boxes. So it gives it in a really concise one, loca one location we could view everything. We organized it. We had a demo running at VMworld where we had you know, three different ISEs laid out. Then I had and, you know, tabs based on different metrics and then the different ISEs underneath it. You could you basically uh, arrange your view in almost any way you wanted to. It was, it was incredibly powerful. It, <clears throat> I'm really looking forward to what our 2.0 version is going to do. This plugin is a management pack. Uh, yes, just a management pack plugin you can download. And it's already available for also VRealize, uh, the version 6.0, VRealize Operations, the new name of uh, VCOPS. 
is uh, version six. Uh, You're talking about the new version of VC Ops that's coming. We're working on that. This is just for the for the existing version that's out there right now. Yep. What kind of metrics is that showing you? Is it sort of hardware? So this right. is a kind of plug it in and forget it box. So it I can plug it and forget it. And it just constantly collects stuff. And then when you want to go see something, you basically can pull it up. So we were able to pull up from all the testing. So one of the things we did in Colorado is we have this, we have this big glass wall in front of the lab, in front of part of the lab where we have the UCS so everybody can see it. And we got a 32 or a 46 inch flat screen and hung it, hung it, hung it on uh, one of the racks on the side facing out. And then we put VC ops up over the course of all the testing we're doing so people could always see what was going on in the environment. It was, it's a really great interface. To make your own reporting out of, it, out of it. I haven't played with the reporting. I've played with just creating the graphing part on this thing. So I know we know the plugins work. We know what metrics we're collecting, you know, that kind of thing. Could you, to, could you stack a few data stores <laughs> in, in a graph? You, well, from the data store level, yeah, but you do that from the data store level, not necessarily the ISE level. But you can also do that from the LUN because a LUN equals a data store, so you could look at it from the LUN side or from the ESX side. So you can look at it from both. It's, it's, it's a really powerful tool. It really got me thinking about it in a different way. That's just compute and RAM. That's just capacity and performance. So when I was doing the testing, initially I got up to 500 users, and then I blew the top off the server, and then they got me another one. And then I got to 1,000 on that one and blew the top off of that thing. And that's why our reference architecture is only 1,500 because I ran out of servers and RAM. That's pretty much why. But it allowed me to treat these things just as commodity components that I'm plugging into my interconnect fabric. So this also gives our, our customers a, a benefit, kind of like Garland Independent School District that wants to put, that uses Teradici cards inside of their C-class blades. Say they have another pool of users that need high performance, no problem. You just drop some, drop some different kind of blades in there, put a different ISE on, or maybe even use the existing ones you've got. It's about giving you flexibility. I mean, it's the same reason now why we don't use DL980s with like 80 cores and like four terabytes of RAM. And that is why you use small blade servers because of the modularity and the flexibility it gives you. It's the exact same idea of how we're scaling the storage as well. So this is the overall architecture of everything we tested. Basically three UCS chassis. We did use uh, Cisco switches uh, to connect to the FI. We've just recently completed our qualifications so that we can directly plug into the FI. Which is a huge, which is a huge benefit. It's a massive amount of cost off the solution. And you only need one partner to work with. <laughs> and you only need one partner to work with. Exactly. That's really nice. We really like that. Sure yeah, absolutely. So what did we essentially test? The main thing we tested, the main thing of this whole thing, is essentially a single ISE 740. Again, two, 10, 200 gig. Uh, these are enhanced endurance MLCs. This is what they call them. Uh, and the 31.2 terabyte drives. So I essentially carved up four LUNs, one terabyte a piece, and presented them to the first cluster. That cluster had about 112 cores and just under 900 gigs of RAM and a single 500 uh, user desktop pool. And then I blew the top off of it. And then they got me another one. And I'm like, hey, that's great. I got another four LUNs, 1.5 terabytes, 192 cores, two terabytes of RAM, two desktop pools of 500 a piece. Then I blew the top off of that one. So that's why we stopped. Now we also had two other LUNs we used for deploy images and we created those RAID 5 because we're just gonna be streaming data off of those guys. We don't need the RAID 1 performance and actually a RAID 5 streaming performance is pretty good. So we're able to use two different things. Now that was the reference architecture testing. That was uh, the video we recorded of it and that was VMworld. So in all of these things, we never touched the storage configuration. I set this up two months ago when they put the second cluster member in and haven't touched it since. Everything we've been doing is at the VMware Horizon View level because we're using uh, VMware View Composer Link clones. So we're being able to, to really concentrate everything up here and it's completely simplified management. And the integration with the UCS, so they put the, the new, CS, new UCS in over a weekend. Then on Monday I was flying to Denver to go you know, configure it and play with some stuff. And, uh, and I literally had all of the ESXi operating systems installed from the plane going to Denver. Like that thing hit 10,000 feet, turned on Wi-Fi, was able to install all these guys. They're all boot from SAN too. So this, was, this got a little more difficult, but everything was done before I hit the ground in Denver. Ridiculously easy to manage. Yeah, boot from SAN from the... Uh... Yep. Okay. Yep, boot from SAN on the ISE, absolutely. Yeah, and I'm not really trained on UCS, so I, was, I had to hunt and peck to find out what I need to do. But it worked. It worked really well. I was, I was just, I was thrilled. So the obvious question at VMworld when I see four times one terabyte LUN is, um, are you, how far are you for the virtual volumes when that will be available? 
We are, we're not far enough that I've been able to test it in my config yet. I know we're working on it in the development labs. I see, I see the guys in there, and every now and then I look at their VMware configs, and I know they got virtual machines. They're, they're VASA compliant. And far it is on your priority list. That's very high. It's, you know, it's, it's, no, it's a massive thing. Yeah, no question about it. Yeah, it's, it's extremely important. Just as important like VAAI was. You know, well, yeah, absolutely. VDIs, it, it just doesn't make sense to carve out one terabyte lens anymore. It was actually one of the biggest benefits for us is yep. that all those guys were in San Francisco yep. not that long ago. So we managed to actually hold them captive and have a private audience with them and, and, and yep. get a lot of the work done there. Yeah, and these guys were only about 50% full. I mean, I only made one terabyte just to make it, and then I was like, you know, I bet I don't need to touch this thing. So could I have made those smaller? Yeah. Could we have used a smaller ISE? Absolutely. While we're at it, feature questions in, as in unmap and so on. Okay. Uh, thin. We don't do thin. Okay. Uh, well, we do. So VMware can do thin. We enable the thin uh, function through our uh, management interface because we've integrated that API. Uh, we can also, I don't know where we are on the Hyper-V. Uh, thin with, with Hyper-V volumes, there's one or two we have problems with, the others we support. Uh, but really, for us, it's about letting the upper-level hypervisors and upper-level management software do those kinds of things, and all we're going to focus on is being very reliable, very fast, and very big capacity. Like a smart JBOD. I like that. I honestly do. You're going to get killed. I know. But to hands is a question, now unmap either. T10 unmap. We don't have to do the unmap because we're not doing thin. Yeah. So we, we, we support, exactly, we support ATS, we support the copy offload and, wait, ATS copy offload and blocks are ring. Yep, just those three. With your 1500 desktop scenario, how close were you to maxing out the XIO box on performance? I don't think we were close, but the CPU and RAM on both of the servers were absolutely at 100%. I mean, it's, I, you don't get to see it very often. A line of like, was it 48 lines, like in the vSphere interface, go all the way up and then just flatline right at the top. And they just literally stay there the whole time. Do we know what the loading percentage was enough? No. The, the latency was still under 5 milliseconds during, the, during most of the run. I think it maybe got up to 7 or 8, but... It wasn't, it wasn't at the limit yet. Now, please don't give Hollis an excuse to buy another pack of server. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Just curious if it's like the server 1501 suddenly knocks you box. Yeah, we're, we're, we're the What's going to be your bottleneck? Like? Is it going to be the controls or the disks? I think it's more than likely going to Or network. Well, no, we have a 10 gig network on there. We just did all kinds of crap. Uh, I'm going to answer that. I actually feel that on that box, it's going to be the controllers. I was thinking so. Um, yeah, and I'm not going to discuss roadmap on camera. <laughs> but that bottleneck's going to go away very soon. Yeah. Yep, I agree. I think it's going to be the controllers first. I mean, we have eight, fiber, eight, eight gig fiber channel connections out of the back of this thing. It's not going to be the network in between, probably the controllers. So in summary, we're already there. So user experience is really what we went after because it's usually the number one cause of, store, of poor user experience is storage performance. So that's the problem we're trying to solve, and especially for VDI because now you're impacting every user in the environment, not just one application. So it, can, it has a really high visibility. So there's really large variations in the VDI workload. And doing the, basing it on the XPod or converged architecture solution really made this a lot easier and really was able to... It let, it let me have a different view of how integrated we are with VMware. And modularity made this very easy to scale. Just drop something new in it. Basically, it's another pool of capacity and performance, and you just start using it. And we start talking about a five-year total cost of ownership. It can be a real big value for the customer, especially if we start getting into six years and going past the refresh cycle. Is there any questions? Back to the synchronous active-active awesome. metro clusters. Mm -hmm. Technically, I don't see any issues with it because there's a number of other people that are already out there doing this kind of thing. Yeah. However, there's one little hiccup is VMware is notoriously reticent about certifying products for stretch, stretch clusters. clusters. It's, just, it's, it's just very expensive to certify against that VMSC uh, certification. Is it cost factor or is it also just VMware is putting the resources out there? Because you're not the first one I've run into this problem. It's not cost, it's time. Uh, they're, they're chunking around the program at the moment, so right. they're on hold. Yeah, that's so, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, it's, it, trust me, if I could throw money at this, I would. I, yeah. it, it's time. Yeah, but that's very clearly, yeah. you want to be in that. They're probably change, the changing their mind on what the product name is. Yeah, yeah don't start. <laughs>
I'm gonna have one joke about that. <laughs> <laughs> you are. Yeah, okay, that's just that's gonna be one. Now, I imagine from your perspective, you're more than happy to support those configurations. Absolutely. You bet. We, we, I mean, we got this validated. This whole reference architecture, we went through VMware validation for that. They work with us really quickly because yep, this. Yep. This solves some problems for them. They exactly. like to see you know, more bundles in this. So this validation actually went through really quickly. If we could do the same with Metro Plus and stuff. Oh. Yeah. As soon as yeah, they're like, that. like anything to do with VDI right now, VMware's throwing the resources Absolutely. necessary at it. Yeah. The Metro Stretch cluster has always been the, the next thing for us actually is to build a, uh, we're looking at lower cost options and some of the servers and stuff like that. Again, under direction from VMware, they've been great about working with us and saying, this is great. This is really good for UCS prospects. Yeah. Who can you build one for something else? And taking a total turn in another direction, uh, OpenStack drivers, stuff like that. We're working on the OpenStack driver that'll be available in the iSCSI product upcoming. Um, and we do have CloudStack support inside of our interface right now. So we can integrate with CloudStack uh, with, a, it's, I think it's Citrix or VMware. OpenStack's not far off. Anymore. CloudStack, no, OpenStack's close. Yeah. And we're getting close. Oh yeah, um, so what do you not do well at if you awesome it? We do not do cheap and deep well. Obviously, I mean, if you really need, like, you need objects. Well, we have an archive product, but it's mainly for customers who have ISEs already. They don't want to get something else to manage, and they want to have something in the existing infrastructure that talks the same. That's what the archive product's for. Sense of gig, cheap and deep serial ATI. Yeah. Yeah. Or if you want to do object storage, like Ceph, get you know, get a super micro box with 36 six terabyte drives, make seven copies of the thing, and call it a day. I mean, we are not good at something like that. There. Are, uh, we can be very good at streaming operations. The problem being that, like I, I worked with a couple of media companies trying to sell ISEs to media companies, and their cost on some of those, those solutions is just so low because they're using two terabyte, four terabyte SATAs, and they just need a ton of space and just stream off of it like crazy. So while we can have really good performance for streaming, the cost point for that kind of video solution is just is, is out of our league. And we don't want to use those drives because the failure rate, our, um, our annual failure rate is 0.1%, we don't want to play with. You get started getting into that, you get into 6 7% failure rates, yeah. keeping all those working. We, we did for a while, a long time ago, we did a serial ATA data pack uh, that we said to customers, you can use it, but it's for low use only. And you tell a customer, don't, and it's like giving someone a car and saying, don't drive it over 30 miles an hour. It's not going to happen. And we, we found out the hard way, don't sell serial ATA data packs because we'll have them burn them out. Yeah. Uh, Especially in environments like so, this. So we just said, we don't do it. We, we're very good at qualifying out. We're quite honest like that. Um, we'll qualify out of the deal. Same as if someone comes to us and said, I need a 100 microsecond latency and, and this IO load. We're like, go on my NSLC flasher. Yeah. Don't, don't come for us. Yeah. We, where we compete, or where we play is, you know, our hard disk box tends to compete with the hybrid players out there, and our hybrid box competes with all flash array players out there, if that makes sense. And the, the last horrible question, price points? Um, this range, based upon the capacity <laughs> points, um, the average, let's take the average of all the models that's out there. Okay, so I saw from the 210 to the 740? Yeah, it's around $90,000. I had a quick question around, um, you talked about your numbers being worst case, which yes. obviously well, sounds great for everybody. Yeah. yeah. So what, it's just an OLTP workload? Yeah, OLTP workload. It's an SPC1 type workload, like, if you know the SPC1 test. Yeah, OLTP, like. sorry, S S uh, OLTP, like. Yeah, like SPC1, like, like we have to be told that by yes. SPC, we don't have to say that. 4K OLTP, I believe. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So some of our customers that we did get, you know, they, you know, just example references from some of our customers, a lot of them are references, you know, basically consistent performance even when it's being worked hard. And uh, the AvMed guys, these were fantastic because they, uh, they really needed some help and they, they did a fantastic job and they're running just, just awesome right now. Excellent. Thank you. Um, thank you guys for uh, participating and paying attention. It's, it's great to have you uh, here at VMworld, um, especially new folks. We've got, uh, I think, three, three new folks around the table right now. Um, thank you guys for joining us. Uh, and I imagine also that if anybody wanted a copy of this uh, paper that you mentioned, they can email gavin at xio.com and they can get a copy themselves. Okay, great.